peanut gallery. Yeah. Oh, back there. Yeah. All right. I'd like to call this Tuesday, December 16th, 2014, Ordinance Committee meeting to order. Uh, we have Councillor Katarina, Councillor Blaze, uh, Town Manager Hall, and Tracy is here for notes for our attendance. Approval of the minutes. Do we have a motion? So moved. And we don't have necessarily a second. Can I second that? Sure. sure. Yeah, I'll second it. Ed wasn't here, so he's going to recluse himself from that. Okay. But I'll second it, Tracy. So we're going to move on to item number four. Which you want is to vote on that? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Vote. Well, uh, let's vote on it then. All those in favor? <laughs> it's all passed. Item four. We're going to move on to the discussion on open burning regulations. Um, yeah, Chief Thurlow um, yeah. intends to be here, I'm quite sure. I have uh, staff chasing him down as we speak. We can either uh, start introducing the matter or we could move on to your second item and pick up when he gets here, whatever your pleasure is. Mike just left, so we just lost our second uh, <laughs> item <laughs> number, so that's not going to work either. Okay. Jessica's going to go work. Any hey, Mike, we're going to bump you up. Is that all right? Sorry that we're going to... No, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to bump... You always wanted to be a fire chief, didn't you? We're going to we're gonna give Chief Thurlow a couple more minutes to get here just so that he's here for this. Um, if he doesn't show up, then we'll, we'll still go. cover yeah. what you're here for because that's what we do. So, But we're going to have Mike go first, if that's okay. Um, you want to give us a like an over start an overview, if you don't mind? Certainly. Uh, we're here to uh, look at changes to the uh, street opening ordinance. The street opening ordinance is uh, kind of the rules and regulations for private contractors and citizens that want to do work in the town's right-of-way, uh, excavations for maybe water main connections, those sorts of things. And uh, the last time this ordinance was updated was 1995. <laughs> And so it's probably time for it to be looked at. And um, the substantial changes that, that have been made in here uh, center around uh, dig safe was just coming online at that point uh, in, in, that, in that time frame. So where there, are where there is reference to contact of utilities, uh, we've changed that to contacting dig safe, which is main state law. Right. Uh, that's one of the bigger pieces. Uh, and then the other uh, more substantial changes are uh, there's a requirement in here for record drawings. So when you put structures in the ground, uh, we need to have information on what changes were made. Mm -hmm. And uh, with our computerized, with our GIS system uh, and our computer mapping, it was important that we have uh, people that are doing work in the town's right-of-way right of submit uh, their record information properly. So we've made mention of that in here. Um, and then perhaps the only the, the third piece that was in here, um, the ordinance talked a lot about uh, the allowance for um, if, you, if you were doing work in the town and you wanted final repairs to be made um, at, at the person's discretion, they could have the, um, have the public works do it. Right. I've taken that out of there because a lot of our, our paving and that sort right. of thing is done by contractor anyway. So the sole responsibility is for uh, the person doing the work to make the permanent repairs. There is still language in here that talks about a long-term maintenance fee and then also that they are responsible for the overall health and the health of that trench. So if it settles in the first three years, um, the, the contractor is still responsible to make those repairs again in the first three years. Okay. And then after that, the long-term maintenance fee takes over uh, okay. if there's any, any future repairs that need to be done. So just a, kind of a, those are the, those are the three um, large, large changes, and then there were some minor format changes in there as well. Great. Perfect. Um, do either one of you have questions? Uh, I just had a quick question. Sure. Um, um, I apologize. Now I can't find it, but. Okay, take your time. Um, we require contractors to be bonded or a liability insurance. Was that? Is that something that's new that was added? Because I noticed that was 
Uh, well, the change was the change was to four hundred thousand dollars for a minimum. Okay. Port liability used to be three hundred thousand. Okay, so it's just so that that was the change. Okay. The, the actual the requirements for a for a uh, for a contractor or anybody working in the town's right of way to have a a specific excavator's license, which is good for a calendar year, and then beyond that, um, this is just more some, more in the way of background, and then beyond that, um, each location that you work in the town has an excavation permit associated with right. it as well. Um, and then uh, con the, the contractor does have to have liability insurance. We are named as additional insured and so forth. So um, those are the, the insurance requirements and the liability pieces are, uh, are uh, standard with, with anything else that we do with, with work in the right of way. Okay, good. Are you good? Uh, Let me come back to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nothing? I may be no. okay, but Ed's hold, good. hold on a second. Okay. Um, Ed's good. I'm good. Um, I ran, ran through the whole thing. Yeah, I'm good. And I, it looked <laughs> really clean to me. It didn't seem like there was anything earth-shattering going on um, that would really cause any issues. Tom, did you have anything you wanted to add? I just want to be sure. Um, the, the issue that I think affects us most, I mean, first and foremost, you want to make sure there are competent and qualified contractors doing the, the work, but it's really the settling over time. I mean, I think we can all appreciate driving around roads and all right. of a sudden you you know where the utility line has come through the road. Um, what are the different methods of surety that we have in place uh, to secure that? So should there be a problem year, you know, two, three years down the road? Uh, how do we make sure and perfect um, the fact that that repair is done and done right? We we have a we have a couple of mechanisms. Uh, t typically, somebody that's going to be working in the right in the town's right of way is going to be an established contractor, so they'll be working in town again. So uh, if if we make them aware, they don't show back up. Uh, we have the option to, and I have done this, not uh, not uh, allow any more permits to be issued until that's fixed. Uh, the other piece is that right after the work is done, uh, we sign off on it. We go, we send out a long-term maintenance fee bill invoice, and so we have that mechanism as well. So, um, you know, so we actually hold cash. Oh yeah, absolutely. And return uh, after a period of time has passed. The long-term maintenance fee doesn't doesn't return mm -hmm. because okay, that's what, what, what I want to know. Yeah, what, yeah, because as you know, Tom, once once you once you cut a road open, you you create seams and that sort of thing. Chances for water to infiltrate. That the, a road is never the same after you cut it open. That right. being said, you still have to cut roads open on occasion. But that's also why we have five-year moratoriums on new roads, right. so that we can we can hold that off as long as possible. Okay. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. Are you good? Yes, ma'am. I'm good too. Um, thank you. I think. I mean, I don't see any issues. I don't see why this. There's any reason for us to hold on to this. Oh, agree. No. I think it should be passed on right. at this point. Um, we want to take a vote on that. Uh, anybody want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, changes that. Uh, uh, Mr. Shaw. Presented to us. And I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. I'll right. work with Council Chair to get this on the uh, upcoming Council agenda then. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. <coughs> okay. Let's go back to item number three. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Item number four. Um, since Chief Thurlow's here uh, with the discussion on open burning regulations. Um, does, should we start? Chief, do you want to start with this, or do you want to I do an intro? I could give a little intro? bit of introduction as to how it ends up here, and I think there are certainly some interested parties here that might be able to help contribute to the conversation. Yeah, let's do that. So, uh, as, as near as I, uh, I've known, um, you know, the town's been dealing with this issue on and off for about four years. Um, most of the time, it's been dealt with at the department level. Chief Thurlow and his staff have been responding to um, calls regarding open burning and complaints about that activity. Uh, kind of fast forward to last year, I became involved at the request mm -hmm. of uh, some folks in town and have come to appreciate the status of the state law that really governs this activity and some of the challenges our staff faces in responding to calls that come in. Um, and I, I met with uh, Mrs. LaRue's here and, and her attorney, Mr. Uh, attorney Irwin, uh, sometime <coughs> midsummer, late summer, I forget the date exactly, 
And frankly, we've been trying to find a time to yeah. get in front of this group. Yeah. And for one reason or another, we just couldn't, weren't able to schedule it. So this is very much a holdover issue yep. that's been kind of kicking around. And I, I will let others kind of speak to what possible options there are. But right. I guess the reason it's in front of you is that uh, the chief nor myself felt comfortable in uh, administratively making some changes or imposing some even limited bans of open burning in town without a wider conversation. I agree. I would also preface this that there are uh, other interested parties uh, yes. that have not, you know, we didn't notify them of this meeting, so right. should this go further, it would behoove us, I think, to, to make sure we expand the audience to make sure everyone understands there's I a conversation agree. and has a, has a chance to be part of it. So I agree. that's really a, a very quick backdrop to what kind of brings us together. Um, okay. I, I would like to say too that I, I personally, um, I just want to state this, um, understand the reasoning behind why you are asking for this. Um, I had a son that had extreme difficulties with his lungs. Um, we couldn't have any fire of anything, I mean, nothing around him. Um, so I want to be clear uh, up front that I understand your plight and why this is such a big deal. Um, I think people that have nice, healthy, clean lungs don't understand what it's like to live with bad lungs and what can happen to people when they're exposed to um, the elements. So I, always, I wanted to make sure that that was um, stated in the record that I may have some, some personal feelings for you. So that being said, um, Chief Thurlow, I think there's probably, we're probably going to have a couple questions for you. Um, and then I would like to um, hear from you, if you don't mind, if that's okay. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. I apologize. I got held okay. up at my last meeting, so I'm a couple minutes tardy, and I apologize. No problem. I think just to add to Tom's introduction, I um, I want to make sure that the committee understands the town of Scarborough currently doesn't have any local ordinance in regards to outside burning. We operate as an agent for the state of Maine, administering state law. Um, so we issue free permits as an agent of the state of Maine. I think the issue, and, and certainly I'd be happy to speak uh, after the LaRue's do, really comes down to a segment in that law that speaks about nuisance mm -hmm. um, and the balance between a citizen's right to burn within the confines of state law and a, another person's uh, rights under the law not to be nuisanced by that. I will tell you just as a point of um, context that we issue, last year we issued 990 outside burning permits. On top of that, there are uh, small cooking fires that don't require permits that happen day in and day out. So right. the number is much larger than uh, 990 per year. On average, I deal with approximately two or three complaints per year um, from neighbors. Uh, generally, it's a matter of explaining state law and explaining the difference between those two things that I just mentioned, and generally neighbors to neighbors take care of it, and, and it doesn't become another issue. Are um, they for health-related reasons, or are they complaints because the people are nervous that there's a fire, or? It, it kind of runs the gamut. Okay. Once again, it's it's two or three, certainly less than five per year that, okay. we, that we deal with on average in the 14 years that I've been fire chief. Okay. I think I'll leave it at that and, okay. and let the LaRue's explain their perspective and certainly am, am here to answer any questions and provide any other comments that you'd find helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Which one of you wants to go first? I'll, I'll okay. Go first. Sure. <laughs> Hi folks. Um, my name's Tuck Irwin. Um, I'm an attorney in Portland. I represent Valerie in a number of family matter issues, um, uh, and uh, I am her lawyer. Uh, I'm here today. Uh, I, I don't think I've met any of you other than Tom in the meeting in June. It was Tom. Thank you. And um, where he was kind enough to meet us. Um, it might be surprising that I haven't met some of you because Scarborough has a lot of issues, um, and it is one of the fastest growing towns in the state, if not the fastest growing town in the state. 
With that growth comes issues like this. Um, and this is a, uh, you have developments going up all over the place. You have Grandview Drive, which is just one of them. And with that, you're going to run into people who, like Valerie, have breathing problems, lung problems, asthma, and similar problems. So you all are going to be dealing with issues in the future having to do with wood stoves, having to do with campfires, having to do with charcoal grills in your backyard. But today what we're dealing with is with open, open burning permits. Um, and that is big bonfires in the backyard. And what, I'm, what we want you all to do is to, to grab on to the issue and to create areas in densely populated areas uh, where the burning is not allowed. Basically no burn zones. It's, um, the reason I'm asking you to do this is not for so much for public policy reasons, but it's for Valerie. I mean, quite honestly, I'm her lawyer. I'm here to protect her. She has found herself in a situation on Grandview, Ave, Grandview Drive where, um, where she is essentially confined to her house when burns, when burns are going on. Um, we went through a nasty dispute with her neighbor um, really unfortunate, um, but it's something that we were able to resolve, um, and that's good. But the problem continues to exist. Um, there are burns that happen all around that neighborhood, and every time it happens, Valerie either has to leave the neighborhood or Valerie has to board herself up in her house in the summertime in air conditioning, in the wintertime, um, without the uh, access to any clean air other than what's in the house already. Now, at one point, early on in this dispute, somebody in the process asked Valerie, well, geez, why don't you just leave? You know, you've got this problem with your neighbors, um, and why don't you just leave? Well, Valerie's not going to leave. Valerie lives here. This is her home. She's not going anywhere. Um, and I would venture to say that that is what all of your residents would say. Scarborough is a wonderful town. Nobody wants to leave Scarborough. Everybody wants to move to Scarborough. Um, Valerie's lucky to be here, and she wants to stay here. Having said that, um, and that, and having made the request now to ask you to help Valerie, protect her, um, to help her and people like her, um, and I, I appreciate, um, Ms. Sinclair, your previous disclosures, all of us know somebody with lung problems. All of us know somebody with breathing problems. None of us would go up to that person's yard and light a big fire. It just wouldn't happen. The problem is, is if you're one door, two door, three doors down, or if you don't happen to be know a person, or if you don't happen to like a person, you don't have that same sense of care. You wouldn't do it for a family member, for a friend, but you might do it. You might set that match. You might start that fire for somebody who either you don't know, you don't care about, um, or you just plain dislike. Um, so what I'm asking you to do is to help Valerie. I'm not, again, not, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a member of the Lung Association. Um, I may be a member, but I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an advocate for the Lung Association. I don't come with that wide perspective. I'm asking you to help protect Valerie in this instance. Now, what that, which gets us to the question, why are we here in front of you all on this? Um, and again, I don't pretend to be an expert in all of the municipal areas of law, um, but we did talk to Tom about it. We very much appreciate the meeting. I know Valerie um, knows the chief um, by way of complaints that she's made. Um, and while I do believe that the town has the ability to administratively resolve this problem, it's just not happening. Um, it's the, the, the town can establish a no-burn zone. You don't need to go through the ordinance process to do that. Um, but it's not something that Tom and the chief are comfortable doing, apparently, so we need to go to you for help. And so for that reason, we think, and, and I understand this is a discussion, um, hopefully to start the ball rolling in this process. Um, for that reason, we're hoping that you consider an ordinance that allows you all to establish, allows the town to establish a no-burn zones in densely populated areas for the sake, in this instance, of Valerie. Thank you. I'd like to give Valerie an opportunity to talk um, and to, uh, uh, to say what she has to say to you all. Sure. 
And right. if, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. I think we will have questions, will. so don't don't go too far. I won't go okay. anywhere. <laughs> go ahead. If you could just state your name and address, too. Just um, for my name is record. Valerie LaRue, and I live at 5 Grandview Drive in Scarborough. Thank you. And I've been there for 18 years. Um, at this time, I don't know... Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to approach this. Um, <laughs> Take your time. This has been something that's been going on with, you know, for me for, for difficult and long years. And um, and it's been something that's greatly affected my health. Um, in the beginning, we weren't sure what was going on. Um, all we noticed was that um, upon open burnings that... Um, uh, physically, I was greatly affected, and so um, my general practitioner, Dr. Freem, um, who is up at Medical Partners, um, suggested that uh, I go see uh, chest medicine, and uh, Dr. Joel Worth is my specialist over there, and he did extensive testing on me and found out that um, we knew I, I was an asthmatic, but... We didn't know that my asthma has a wood smoke allergy, and that seems to be my problem. And that was why every time there was an open burning, uh, I was getting severely affected and almost, you know, put into, I've come very close with uh, attacks um, a few, just for a few times. And uh, my physician, Dr. Worth, has helped me greatly through um, dealing with situations. I'm not on medical insurance, nor can afford to be, and so um, I'm lucky enough that I've had physicians that have been able to be by my side and help me through uh, so that I, I didn't have to incur a, you know, a, a, a buggy ride to the hospital and that. So um, they've been very good to me. Um, the issue is that um, not only do I have that, but I'm also afflicted with a myelodysplasia, which is a white blood cell disorder. And it, with that, on top of the as, it just tends to um, uh, uh, make the asthma conditions worse and more elevated. Um, uh, so um, it's something that tends to make, uh, you know, my sicknesses longer and more severe, and it tends to affect the asthmatic condition as well. Um, and with that in mind, with that um, blood disorder, it also affects my abilities or capabilities, if you will, of um, receiving um, certain medications, um, many medications my body will not tolerate. And so I am, I'm unfortunately unable to take um, many of uh, basic medications like ibuprofen, up to some medications for asthmatics, which are like corticosteroids, et cetera. Um, so basically at this time, um, you know, um, uh, what ended up happening was situations just kept on getting worse, and my symptoms kept on getting progressively worse. I got in touch with um, uh, the town health officer, Dr. Kirsch, and I spoke to him about my situation, and I think that's probably how... Uh, this probably came about was the suggestion of a no burn zone for me uh, based on my health safety issue, um, really by Dr. Kirsch. He, he had concerns over the situation, and um, there's just no way that I'm just, um, I guess I'm, there's just no way I'm going to avoid this. I'm very sensitive to it, and uh, my health situation just makes it that way. And, um, and at this point in time, I'm hoping that um, I can request a no burn zone. Um, I understand that other municipalities in the state, um, mostly Wyndham, I, I was able to discuss my situation with Chief Thurlow there in Wyndham, and he uh, let me know that uh, people like me in his town would, would definitely be uh, people that, you know, would, um, would probably need and require a no burn zone area around them. And hence, you know, I said, well, <laughs> I, I guess really I have to be honest with myself. I'm in that category, and, and I guess really that this is what I need in order to be able to live and to be able to live here in the, in the town of Scarborough, unfortunately. But, um, and uh, like I said, I, I guess um, <coughs> uh, this is 
you know, where I'm at at this time. Uh, you know, I wear my medical alert. I have medical alert around my neck, and I have to update it every year with the medical alert. And, and uh, this was suggested by my specialist that I have these on. And, um, and I do, you know, bring them to attention if I need to, to firefighters or whoever, you know, I need to. Um, so that's always there on my person. And um, I, I don't know what else to say at this time. All I'm looking for is some relief um, because at this point in time, when I'm not in contact with the smoke and that um, I can lead a normal life. I can, I don't need my medication and, um, and I can lead a normal, a normal life. And I can go outside and, you know, and I can live in my home without being affected by it. Um, and that's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to protect myself uh, more than anything. So at this time, I'm, I'm really requesting a no-burn zone for my health safety. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> did you, uh, did you, Ed, did you want to speak at all? Uh, Are you? Sorry, okay. I just wanted to give you the opportunity since you came. Um, sure. And then I think we'll, I, I know that so my fellow so counselors have some questions. Um, I, I think it should be clear, and, and I'm sure it's obvious, it's, we're not going to have a resolution to this today. Um, this is just the first step in this process. Um, but I do have some ideas, and I, I, I know my fellow counselors, I'm sure, also have some ideas. and. Um, I don't want you to get discouraged, and you know we're we're going to do the best we can to try to help you, but it's going to take it's going to take a little bit of time. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Miller. I'm the vice president for public policy for the American Lung Association. I work out the Augusta main office, and I'm a resident of Hollowell. And appreciate your time. I'll just be very brief. One, I'd like to just um, state that the kind of frustration uh, that Valerie has had has been very very difficult for us to work with her over. Those, those four years. She's not alone. I, my territory covers um, seven states. These are issues that occur in many places. And um, in my 40 years of public health, uh, I can tell you this is a very difficult problem, uh, but there are solutions to it. Forty years ago, I'd be sitting here, and whether you'd be smoking or not, there'd be ashtrays on this table here, okay? So things do change, and things that we once thought were harmless actually we find out are quite harmful. And one of our goals, while you probably know us more for our work in tobacco, one of our goals is that the air that we breathe shouldn't make us sick, or if we have lung disease, it shouldn't make it worse. I mean, that's just a basic premise that we come in with. So we come, we come to this with the, um, with the approach that um, you have the right to breathe clean, healthy air. That's, that's a fundamental right. So a couple of things just to add to the dialogue on this. One is that... Um, we, we are not anti-wood burning as a lung association. In fact, um, mm -hmm. currently I'm operating a $2 million wood stove change-out program in Rhode Island uh, where we're having people bring in old, high-polluting, non-EPA certified stoves and trading them in for gas, pellet, and other wood stoves. And it's improving the air quality tremendously, tremendously in those communities. And Is we're hoping to do burn, more right? of that in Maine. Excuse me? That's a clean burn, right? Clean burn, and it's, um, it, and it's, it's having a huge impact. These, these stoves that people are bringing in, are, you know, they, have to, they have to show us a picture of them. Uh, these are your these are your, your, your 1972 vintage. These are not uh, these stoves don't wear out. You know they're, they they have them forever. But one of the things I learned through this through this whole process of of um, of, of dealing with uh, wood smoke is that we want to make a distinction between people who are burning wood to keep warm, to heat their homes, to to, to save some money in a high cost state to heat your home. I make a huge distinction between that and what I call recreational wood burning. Right. And there's two things that are important to understand about it. One, even though, even though there's, with these old wood stoves, there's a fair amount of pollution, two things are quite different. One is, it's usually going up a chimney. You know, I worked hard in Maine here to make sure that these outdoor wood boilers that had about 10 foot stacks were extremely regulated and most of the bad actors in that are shut down. So it's being dispersed high in the at higher in the atmosphere than something on somebody's deck. Okay, so that's important to understand. The other thing is we, we also tend to focus on the visible smoke and more and more research is being done now that it's these ultra fine particles 
that actually can go right through the ventilation systems in, in buildings. They, they can come and penetrate to the, to the home. So it's important to understand that there's a danger there. And then the, the third thing that I'd say is that we tend to think of um, a population that's at considerable risk for this kind of exposure to wood smoke being people who have asthma or lung disease. Uh, however, the largest population that's at risk are people who have cardiovascular disease because these small particles are toxic and they're small enough they go through the lungs and directly into the bloodstream have been shown to cause heart attacks. So when you begin to look at our population, you know, we're the, we're the oldest population in the country, means we've got a lot of people with chronic illnesses. I think, that as, as was said earlier, you're going to see this kind of issue arise again uh, and again. So I think the idea of c trying to come up with some kind of uh, situation and solution to this that works, is this is not a, a one and done. I think you're going to see this uh, come up, and this is a good way of trying to prevent future kinds of uh, situations. So thank you very much. be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I, I think we're going to open up for questions. I want to just I want to ask two quick questions and then I'm going to let my fellow counselors go and then I'll Tom might have some stuff and then I'll finish up but um one one question I had is the the burning that people are doing in their homes to heat their homes that's a difference between the burning that they're doing recreationally outside on their decks yes or no that's one of my questions. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, that's one of my questions. Is that, does that affect you differently? Yeah, if you could no, go. You can't can you, can you no. go to the, po just because people are actually watching at home so they can hear you. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is, and is whether, they, they, whether a wood stove in a house affects you mm -hmm. or whether it's the outside burning mm -hmm. in particular that affects you. Okay. Like yeah. people that are sitting around a, uh, you know, yeah, they have pit. these the the, pit. the outside pit. pits. Is that is there a difference between that versus somebody who's burning wood in their home to keep their home warm? I I am affected by wood stoves. Okay. Uh, wood pellet stoves. I I definitely am. Okay. Um. Uh. Right now, actually, on a daily basis, I am. Uh. There's a degree, though, of difference between. Uh, the outside burnings uh, definitely affect me stronger and quicker. Uh, well, quicker, mm, stronger. Okay. They're strong. They definitely give me more difficulties. The onset uh, is much quicker, and I'm more likely to have an attack um, from a, a recreational outdoor burning. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely am greatly affected by the uh, wood burning stoves, and uh, I I do every day. I monitor. This is actually my, I keep a log every day, and I check my breathing at least four times a day, if not more, as, as ne necessary. And uh, basically, uh, I have a meter at home that mm -hmm. I breathe into, which tells me. Mm -hmm. and, and I can tell, too, by the way, that my body's reacting mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm having a, a, a problem at this time. After four years, I know what, I, I can tell by the way I feel what's coming. Um, so... Um, but uh, definitely the outdoor recreational burnings definitely are stronger. Okay, and my second question is, um, you know, we've, we, we have some background information. Have you approached your, your, your neighborhood? I mean, are they, is your entire neighborhood aware of your situation? My, my neighborhood's definitely aware of the situation. Okay. Um, uh, you know, this has been a very difficult situation for me over the years because yeah. there's been plenty of times where I've had to deal with things and be quiet and, and sit yep. and, and deal with whatever I have to go through. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yes, cause to the point where basically some of my, you know, one of my neighbors tried to put a, and actually did put a, a um, order of protection against me because I was trying to, I was trying to protect my health by calling uh, the police department and the fire department, and they decided that they got too many calls, so they used against me in court and basically tried to put an order of protection on me. So I went through a long period where, uh, with my previous attorney before Tuck, that um, I had to kind of sit quiet and, and deal with stuff, and I had no one to call, and, um, and I couldn't get anybody to put the fires out, and, and I still can't get the firefighters to understand 
even though when they come in home that they, they can see I'm greatly afflicted by it. I, you know, I show them my tags and, and uh, they still can't and won't put the fires out. Okay. So it's something that is, yeah, yeah, it's been very difficult for me to endure. So the name, of, okay. Yeah. Um, you want to go first? Sure. Go ahead. Sorry, Ray, Sure. Go ahead. Team Valerie, quick question for you. Um, one of my questions was um, the difference in the impact between pellet wood, because people do use that, as, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, to help heat their mm -hmm. homes, and, and the re so called recreational backyard mm -hmm. chimeras and fire pits right. and whatever the heck, you know, people are burning. Um, one of my questions for you is how far away is the source of the smoke? I'm, I'm, let me mm -hmm. back up. No, it's okay. Uh, is there a particular distance where it doesn't bother you anymore? Uh, or is it immediately adjacent, contiguous uh, to your property? Or we've been trying to we've been trying to <laughs> narrow that down to try and figure out exactly what proximity that I'm affected that I can okay. that my asthma will pick up. You know the the and effect, be affected by the wood smoke. Yep. Um, and and in actuality, I mean, I live on Grandview Drive, right. and you you know where the hotel is yep. down Easter, and I've been able to pick up their fires that they've had at night. Uh, that's probably the <coughs> pretty close to the farthest I think that I've been able right. to pick the up root a fire. Water. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'd say I can. So a, how about people burning fire in fireplaces? Because, like, Christmas, I, people won't yeah, burn no. any wood except for yeah. fire in the fireplace at Christmas time. Right? The, the thing is, is uh, I'm finding that basically it seems like the more ground, uh, the more they're uh, closer to the ground area, Okay. So I guess, and small. more, yeah, is where I pick it up the strongest usually. Um, I, I think... Uh, Naturally, an outdoor burning is a real uh, uh, strong fire yeah. Yeah. compared to like what you know. And most most people have their wood stoves chimneyed up, which helps me a great deal. Right. Um, it affects me, but like I said, not nearly as much as like these, I said, yeah, yeah. These recreational so-called yeah. And I do ones. I do happen to have a wood stove in my neighborhood that is exhausted right off the back deck. And that one severely a pellet stove. Yeah, and that one severely affects me daily. Okay. Yeah, that one because because it's because yeah. it's not chimneyed. Right. It goes right out into their backyard and basically goes out right. and goes in mine. Because I know my conundrum here as a counselor. I know. Looking at the whole. Yes. You know, town of Scarborough, and you know, I certainly understand. This is the not the fact that you know yeah. reasonable accommodations and whatever people with disabilities. I used to do work in the disability field, actually. This has not been a fun issue for me. I understand people's right. rights, but the more time went on, you know, right. I, I had to understand that I have rights too. No, no, and and, 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 and if you let me finish, sorry. Um, so what? So what? We need to be looking at from a town council point of view is. Weighing the rights of those, you know, with with lung conditions that are affected by smoke, with the rights of people to heat their homes, for example, with wood. Um, and I know there are rules and uh, around, you know, burn and burn permits. My husband's on the fire department, so I know <laughs> how many burn permits was and when they can be issued, or whatever. And I do have a couple questions for you, Chief. When, um, so that's that's the conundrum. That I'm sure you understand that that we're running mm -hmm. in, into, but um, how about uh, the latest and greatest thing for people? Are they they're now building these fire pits with gas? They burn them with gas as opposed to wood. still it's still see. I have one neighbor in my neighborhood that has one that is uh, that is gas, um, yeah. but they're still but they're still burning the wood. They're still burning with wood somehow. Really? Oh, they're still okay. burning with right. wood. Because yeah. I'm still able to, I can pick that one yeah. up. I okay. pick that one up. I mean, like I said, and unfortunately for me, <coughs> I have to be on the sensitive side of things. Yeah. And, and I, my, uh, it, and in a way, you know, my uh, my specialist told me, he said, you're luckier than a lot of others. And I said, really? How so? <laughs> and he said, because actually, he said, you, I, 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 I used to be able to pick up the smell. 
and mm-hmm. that used to right away kick me off to uh oh, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. and the minute I go in to check my my breathing, it was starting to drop already. I I've, I've had great difficulty with that lately. I am not able to sense it by smell that much anymore that it's coming my way. But um, but my asthma um, has been it is sensitive and it it always picks it up. I can't tell you. I'm amazed sometimes with I'll sit there saying. Really? I'm really picking up something? And sure enough, um, you know, my fiancé would go outside and look around, and sure enough, there we know, there was a fire out there, and my okay. asthma was had picked it up. Okay. So. Do you have any other questions for her? No, I just have questions for Chief Thurlow and for Mr. Irwin. So. Okay, so let's go to yep. them, and then we'll let Ed take over. Could I just make one comment while the Chief takes it? And I, yeah. I, I want to say in uh, to preface his comments, just so we can <laughs> either confirm or de- or deny what I'm about to say, but the typical scenario where his office is is involved does not involve the issuance right. of an open berm permit. It's someone right. um, uh, with a recreational right. so-called cooking fire in their backyard, right. and right. so they are um, responding to a complaint, right. and, and and that's a challenging situation for his staff to be in. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, he, that was your question. Sorry. No, that's part of it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, questions. I mean, I, I understand the burn permit, uh, you know, what the procedure is and whatever. Um, just for people who are listening or are interested, in Scarborough, can I just go out and set a fire in my backyard or have a, a have a cooking pit or put a chimera on my deck? What are the rules around around that in essence, just for the, so people can understand. Sure. You have to have a permit if you're building a, a fire and burning brush and those types of things. If you're having a cook fire in a contained vessel, uh, and those vary in design, uh, a cooking fire does not require an open burn permit. And, and there are a lot of those. To, to Tom's <coughs> introductory comments, of the complaints that we get, Two-thirds of them are probably related more towards open burning. Mm-hmm. People are um, scared that the pile is too big or creating too more smoke or, you know, is a danger to their property. Um, the minority of them are really um, the cooking fire type complaints. Uh, we get very, very few of those. Can you, d- can you define what we mean by cooking? I know that's an interesting one. Well, <laughs> Hot dogs, marshmallows, I mean, in in this particular case, when I went back and reviewed the files and looked at the complaints to prepare for this meeting, uh, a lot of them, when we actually went down and investigated, and and let me preface by saying, I'm extremely sympathetic of Ms. LaRue's Mm -hmm. medical condition, and I want the council to be very clear that we have investigated every single one of her complaints, either the police department, the fire department, or both on many occasions, um, and... Uh, we really are stuck in the middle. <laughs> yes, we, yeah. we we have on a number of occasions uh, asked her neighbor to extinguish fires when the smoke was clearly blowing in that direction, and it was obvious to an you know impartial arbitrator that this was clearly creating a nuisance, and yeah. and we did that on a number of occasions. There have been a number of other occasions when we would get down there, the wind was blowing in the opposite direction, we were in her house or on her deck, and and couldn't detect uh, a problem. So that that puts our people in a tough spot because on the one hand, we we have a legitimate medical concern and and certainly sympathize and and understand that, but we're also listening to somebody say, my kids just want to cook some marshmallows tonight. The wind's blowing in the opposite direction. We're doing no harm. It's our yard. We should be able to enjoy that. And that's the the problem we find ourselves stuck in. Okay. But yeah, that was those were my Okay. You're, so are you okay? With, yeah, my I well I have one for Mr. Irwin. Like Wait, but why don't you, you go? Why don't you go? And then I'll um, let you know. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. What is your definition of open burning? What is my definition of open yeah. burning? I mean, uh the attorney was, was talking before about open burning. So I think we've got to define what open burning is. Mm. Well, I, I think it's defined in the statute that you had a copy of the state law. I mean, it's basically it's any type of burning that is done outside of a cooking fire. <laughs> outside of cooking. Outside yes. of cooking? Yes. 
So probably so, anything So, you know, burning leaves, burning trash, burning piles, a bonfire, the, all those types of things are and those, those little those little things that sit on people's patios, are those open burning? Is that open burning? No, if it's in a vessel like that, we consider those cooking okay. fires. If people are roasting marshmallows or cooking a hot dog on something like that in a small confined container where it can't go anywhere, uh, we don't issue permits for those. We consider those cooking fires. But those still bother you. Any open fire bother you. Any, anything that... <coughs> About the lower anything to the ground that uh, sends out smoke from... And it's got to be from wood? Yes. And wood pellets. And wood pellets. And you mentioned before that wood pellets are the new super clean burning, right? Clean earth. Clean earth. I'm not clean enough. Anytime yeah, you burn something, and you probably remember these arguments from past on secondhand smoke issues, there's no state level. I mean, there's no state level. That's, that, that, that's the beginning for, it, for any of us. But, uh, so you try to minimize exposure. And I think the, the issue here around um, what may be called cooking fire is probably cooking 1% of the time it quits. The rest of the time, it's just a fire. When the marshmallow is done, the fire is still going. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Kim. We're a little more laid back in the ordinance <laughs> committee than we are at the <laughs> council level. <laughs> um, you want to keep going? Even more questions? No, I think Mike's pretty, pretty much. You're good. Yeah. Um, I know that Councilor Katarina has a question for the um, attorney, and then I'll try and then let I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, I've got some. You for the attorney? Yeah. Yep, okay. absolutely. You're both. Go ahead. Actually, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, that way they, um, they can see the audience. <laughs> People actually do watch this on TV. I know it's. I know. <laughs> but they do. I'll be getting fan letters. I hope. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and I, I can only imagine, you know, this is a difficult issue uh, from a legal point of view uh, when you're balancing rights between uh, parties. Um, how large an area would we be talking about, because you, you brought forward the uh, concept of uh, a ban or whatever mm -hmm. on, on uh, local burns, uh, how large an area would you consider reasonable? Um, or how would you define that, I guess? I can't give you a a, a, a distance. Okay. Um, I just haven't done that research, and I'm sure if I were to work with Mr. Miller and come up with a recommendation, I would certainly do that. Um, one place I would start would be the distance from the Down Easter Motel mm -hmm. to Valerie's house. That's my that's that, that's what Valerie tells you is the distance that she smells that sh that she is affected by this. Mm -hmm. So I can't give you a distance on that. I'm happy to make a recommendation about that, mm -hmm. and it may be a case in case by case scenario too. I mean, I'm envisioning something. Uh, again, as I said, the densely populated areas are the areas I think that are of mm -hmm. concern, like Grandview Drive. Uh, are you aware of other communities that have? That these so-called bans on the open burning that we could uh, do some research on that you could forward to us? Yeah, I think um, we can, I think Valerie and I can probably forward you some material. Valerie's been in touch with Chief Hammond in Wyndham, who's, yeah. who's dealt with this right. issue. Right. Um, and I understand that Chief Hammond is, um, uh, has, has, has some concerns about this, and that may be a place to go. I know that many towns mm -hmm. have no burn zones. For example, mm -hmm. Cape Elizabeth has no burn zones in many of its residential areas. Yeah. You all at Scarborough prevent burning in Prout's Neck. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not by ordinance. Right. That's by fire department standard operating procedures. Right. During the summers, you can't burn out there. So the, the, you can do that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know why they do that, but that's what they do and the authority is there. I would think that the health concerns of your residents would be the prim primary reason to do it. Well, I know I summer at Peaks Island, mm -hmm. and there's allegedly no there's no open burns on Peaks Island uh, because I, fighting a fire on the island is ridiculous. However, they can't do much about cooking fires. That's why I ask. Right, right. and cooking fires presents a dilemma. It does present because if you put a bunch of rocks in a circle, you build a fire, right. and you put a marshmallow over it, that's right. a cooking fire. Right. And let's be clear, for Valerie, 
a wood stove, a cooking fire, and an open burn, which is the, the term that the statute uses and the Department of Environmental Regulation uses, right. um, they all affect Valerie. So, for example, her neighbor who has a pellet stove that blows out the side of the house, that has a definite effect on Valerie. A clear resolution of that was build a chimney. That would, uh, so I'd love, I'd love the, the committee to consider that chimney as an option. Is that a reasonable accommodation on the part of the other, per, out of other party? It may be. Uh, is it a reasonable accommodation? Yes. Is it something mm -hmm. that the other well, party? Well, I'm, I'm saying legally. I mean, <laughs> you get, as you know, and I know, you know, that you get into, you can get into some real like, well, what's reasonable and well, who's got to pay for it and, and those types of issues. That's so. right. But I, I think that from a town's perspective, mm -hmm. it, one neighbor versus the other, what's reasonable? Should Valerie be required to sue this person in order to do that? And is is that other person required to reasonably right. accommodate? Those are all questions that may be answered in the negative, including that whether that neighbor actually has the obligation to reasonably right. accommodate. Right. What is clear mm -hmm. is that the town can say, I'll tell you what, this is what we want if, for example, you have a wood stove or a wood pellet stove. Run a chimney up the side of the house. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Mm -hmm. That's easy. But I'm wondering about retrofitting. I mean, I'm, I, and again, if you, if you got to know me better, I, I like to play devil's advocate at times and really kind of <laughs> dig beneath. And, I appreciate and, that. And, and, you know. I feel I know you already. Tease out, <laughs> and tease out the different and I think we're parts of this. I, yeah. I think that w this is going to be a process. And yeah. we're going to have to, there's going to yeah. be a lot more questions that follow. Okay. Is there, a, are, do you have questions yeah. for the attorney? Go ahead. Um, what has Valerie done inside her house to help protect her from mm. bad air from the outside? I think that's, I, I may have to divert, defer to Valerie on that. We've talked, it's been a little while since we talked about that, but I know she has air conditioning systems that she's installed. I know that she sealed, her house is sealed. Um, she's been careful about sealing the windows and whatnot. Um, I don't think you have a special purification system that would cost a fortune anyway. No, I have just a regular, you know, air purifying system. And, yeah, we had one of those. Yeah, and, and you have to be right. Oh, sorry, thank you. We have things going constantly, so. I hope you've had your radon tested, too. Uh, yes. Okay, because yes. when you put those when, things in. No, when I moved into the home, there's a radon system that's actually built in in case we ever needed it, and at this time, we have not. Okay. So. Okay. Um, also, does a charcoal fire or a gas grill bother you? No, sir. I heat my home with gas, natural gas, and uh, never have had a problem with it. it it's, it's, it's clean, it's cheap, and uh, believe me, it's the way to go for heating. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And no, uh, charcoal grills and gas grills do not bother me, no. No, okay. sir. Unless it's a smoker. Uh, <laughs> if you put wood chips in it, yes. Uh, anything else? This is complicated. This is not simple. No. no well, and that's my point, is that right. this is just the beginning. And I, I, I caution you. That's why I wanted to say that in the beginning, that this is just us oh. touching the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's very sensitive. It's a it's very, very sensitive, sensitive issue. When you yeah. talk you about cooking fires versus I understand. recreational right. burning, and you that's need a to very difficult fine line that you draw absolute, between absolutely. the two. And you Most need people are recreational burning. They're not I understand. cooking. They're really not. I understand. Trust me. I know. Um, and I need you to be prepared for the fact that we will be going to the neighbors and um, having to involve them in the process. Um, and talking to different people that are mentioned in some of these things and um, that's how we're going to get to the end of this and this could it, this w I'm not going to say could this will take months um, we're going into the winter season so hopefully that's a good thing for you maybe there won't be as many fires out there um, as there are in the summer because people don't I tend to recreationally burn yeah, as much yeah. or hang out outside. <laughs> I hope that that helps you a little bit and that we can buy a little bit of time because we're going into the winter season. Um, I know that we're we're going to have lots and lots of questions, um, and I very much appreciate you being so open. I know this is a very difficult topic for you. Um, you I know. Go keep. You still have something to say. Go ahead. Yeah, I just just one question. Uh, the fire up on Route One. Oh, yeah. Did that really bother you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
they, uh, to my knowledge, knock on wood, um, that uh, uh, it seems that when Dr. Kirsch got on board after that, um, it seemed that after that period of time, the burnings stopped in that uh, uh, from the down easter in the area that they had set up for. They had a very large area, a large pit external area outside where they used to they used to burn extremely large bonfires out there. You couldn't miss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my knowledge, right now um, they've cleaned up the area, and I don't think they burn over there anymore which has been very pleasant, and I've been very appreciative of however that came about. I don't know how, uh, but that one was, the size of the fires were so large that definitely, uh, I'm, I was definitely affected by those fires, mm -hmm. and uh, it did definitely travel that distance. I'm, I'm talking about the fire across from Lois's, the fire. building fire. On Route 1. On Route 1. The, oh, I paid that one. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I didn't know what it was at first. All I know is that when my fiance came home from work, that uh, he was the one who told me that it was the fire up on uh, on uh, on Route One. All I knew is that I knew there was a fire out there. I could sense it. I could sense it was a large fire in that, but I didn't know anything other than the fact that it was definitely affecting my asthma okay. and sending it into a tizzy. <laughs> okay. And, and and when it begins to affect your asthma, what do you have to do? Yes, sir. Uh, at, when I do feel uh, uh, when I do feel something come on, it usually greatly affects my breathing more than anything at first, and um, and basically I would get hoarse, and I have different other uh, I get a very strong migraine headache and things of that nature. There's different you know depending on the smoke. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I basically check my breathing immediately, and I always have an inhaler. Um, uh, uh, for an emergency purposes, when my, when it when something sets it into a tizzy like that, I'm, I have my inhaler right Do away. Do you require oxygen at all? No, not yet, not yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tom, did you want to add anything before I wrap up for, t well, for today? Not necessarily going to help you, but I think t Jim Reese alluded to it twice. I mean, the issue at the heart of this is really the essence of government in mind. You know, Absolutely. It's trying to understand individual rights and balance mm -hmm. against the needs of others. Mm -hmm. And there are other folks potentially affected by what, we, mm -hmm. what we're talking about, and I think it's vitally important in terms of process uh, and transparency to make sure those folks are, can witness the conversation and, yeah, and no, certainly just, contribute uh, perhaps another perspective. And it's those sorts of thorny issues that um, kind of bring us to this point, and right. I hopefully now appreciate that it's not as simple as it might seem on the surface. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's going to be important when we involve your neighborhood. Um, Ed, I don't know if you're willing to come back, but um, anytime we can, when we bring in a, a group of people, I think it's always nice to have an expert there um, that can help field questions. And I, and I think sometimes when you have conversations with people and you get them on your level and you get them to understand it sometimes can go a long way, and I'm not saying that that's going to make everyone in your neighborhood happy, but there may be a way to help resolve some of this in a, in a more peaceful way. I hope that's my that's my intention, and that's my that's my hope. And, and I'm not looking forward to this at all. I understand because the last four years yes. I've been through put through hell. Yes. I have been harassed. I've read. I have been. Your I read the entire I hate, file. I hate to bring it up, and this this scares me. Yes. Okay. I understand. Uh, because of the things that I have been put through, and now all of a sudden there has been a little bit of activity starting around my neighborhood right now, you know, of, uh, you know, peeling out um, behind my house and, and uh, you know, and loud activity that okay. has just recently started within the last week. So I'm just hoping that, you know, that true from my point of view that, uh, you know, things can stay civil or yeah. under control. Well, and you let, let us take the lead on this at this point. You've now turned it over to us. Um, Tom's very good at, I've been in multiple meetings with Tom in, in some neighborhoods and in some contentious issues, and um, we've been able to sort of work through some some things. So um, I have faith in this council uh, that we will be able to do that. 
um, but you just got to give us a little bit of time and have a little bit a little bit more little little bit more patience um, than you've already you've showed. I know, I know, and I appreciate that, and I'm I'm glad that we're finally um, able to talk about it. I'm glad it was on our agenda. Um, it was wonderful to meet all of you, and I appreciate the time that you've given to us. Um, and like everyone here said, it's a it's a, it's a touchy subject because you do you do your people people have rights to, on their property. Um, so I would say give us you know uh, this next month to kind of get everything lined up, and I'll um, talk with my fellow counselors. I'll meet with Tom. Mm -hmm. um, we'll also be talking to the chair of the um, council, and uh, we'll go from there. But we'll definitely keep you. Um, updated as to where we are and what we're doing and if you're willing to come back at some point um, I think that that's always useful and helpful that'd be wonderful that would be wonderful and I, I'm not I'm not an expert um, but I did my son did for eight years suffer with extreme lung disease so I do know quite a bit about it and how it all works um, so yeah yes um, actually, I was going to ask you, um, there is a letter from him, and he did say that we could contact him if we had questions. Are you comfortable with me reaching out to him? Yeah. He well, has an email address. Um, be careful. That Dr. Kirsch is the town. Oh, town Kirsch. Oh, I thought you were talking about your, no, no, I'm talking no, no, about no. your doctor. Oh, I don't know Dr. Kirsch. Okay. So um, I'll defer to Tom on that one. But your doctor um, said that we could contact him. And actually, I know him. <laughs> so... Uh, if you're okay with that, then we may end up doing that just to get a little bit of information. But I think we yeah, can... Yeah, I think Dr. Kirsch would be willing to be part of the conversation. I, I'm quite sure he is going to have faith in his uh, his medical colleague that uh, there was a yeah. documented condition, and I suspect uh, we know what his response is. But yeah. I, I can reach out to him. I guess the question to the committee, uh, is there interest in pursuing a solution for this particular problem? So considering a, a ban or some sort of regulation specific to this area of town, or, or is there consideration for a wider approach, you know, densely populated areas was suggested? Uh, I say that only in terms of notice right. and, and efforts between now and the next time you convene. My feeling on it would be I would like to take a month to uh, feel it out and figure out what the best approach is. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'm comfortable, like, saying right now, Okay. My opinion is that um, I'd like to see this as a more a broader based uh, addressing of this potential issue. And the reason I say that because I think it would be an easier sell than if you're saying oh, it's just you guys down in this area. But if we had a town wide, you know, this is how these issues will be addressed by the town in toto as opposed mm -hmm. to an individual situation. Uh, and I hope, and I know you will be receptive to staff input. Chief Thurlow in particular, it will be oh, his absolutely. staff that needs to communicate this oh, out absolutely. and enforce it so. going forward. So having a work, whatever it ends up being, it needs to be right. understandable and workable. Well, for me, simplicity is always better. Sure. <laughs> and, and keeping it so that it's easy, you know, we went, we've gone through this with other ordinances where it, it's gotten a little hairy because we've tried to make special allowances and mm -hmm. I think that's a slippery slope. So, Ed, do you have an opinion on how I you I think it should be localized. You think it should be localized? Yes. <laughs> so we have a different opinion. This is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about zones. We were. Yeah, I, I would agree let's, with Ed on let's that. Deal with, let's deal with one zone. Really. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm talking about then it would be a zone like throughout Scarborough, like for example, the, the, what no, the no, attorney no, gave us. No, 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 let me finish. <laughs> Would be, uh, as Mr. Irwin mentioned, is like, for example, in a densely populated, right. you know, that there's some limitations. That's what I mean by that. I don't mean, never mind. That's where I, I'm coming I, from. That's why I, I want to see it addressed for the town as a I whole. I think. Because politically, it'll be a, it'll be a better style. I, I think at this, I think, I feel pretty strongly at this point that we need it. We need to hash this out more, okay. um, and I think we need a month to talk amongst ourselves and 
and um, take some direction from staff to figure out where we want to go and how we want to go. Yeah. I was just trying to get a sense of whether yeah. this could be on your next agenda and uh, what it, work uh, Actually, it, I want it on our next agenda yeah. because I want to keep it, I want to keep talking about it. Even if we're, even if it's only a five minute update, at least it's on the agenda so that we're, okay. we're still discussing it. So it'll be on our agenda for next month. It may, it could possibly be a five minute update just saying where we stand with it, but it's still going to be there. So rest assured, we're still going to be discussing it. Okay? Okay. Are you guys good? For, can we move on? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item number six is a discussion on the amendments to the property tax assistance ordinance, um, which talks about expanding eligibility to include disability and increase the maximum rebate amount. Tom, do you want to start with this? Yeah, these are two kind of distinct, uh, I'll say, policy matters that yeah. I think both deserve some conversation and, and uh, decision independently. Uh, the one that I brought forward to you at your, I think, last meeting had to do with possibly expanding the eligibility standards to include those that receive SSDI, those are uh, you know, federal Social Security disability benefits. Um, as a way of being eligible for, for the program. Yeah. Um, theory being, uh, like folks of a certain age uh, retired, they're on fixed income, and property tax payments may be a challenge because of that fixed income. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, the committee did last month was kind of either task me with or encourage me to understand yeah. kind of the magnitude of what we're talking about, and yeah. Karen Martin helped me doing a, a little research into the U.S. Census Bureau's statistics. And I need to tease this out a bit further, but it looks as though, I mean, I'm going to assume that we should be looking at a population of 18 years or older, because those are likely to be taxpayers, mm -hmm. uh, property taxpayers. Uh, so there's about 1,400 folks, apparently, that um, okay. uh, in 2012 currently are, uh, receive SSDI payments. So okay. that gives us a sense of order of magnitude. Okay. Uh, that's not to say everyone that has that would actually apply and receive these benefits. Right. We know that there are probably thousands of residents who, for whatever reason, don't choose to take advantage of the current benefits that are mm -hmm. eligible. That's um, very true. So uh, uh, that's kind of order of magnitude worst case scenario. Okay. Um, and I think there are ways to fairly simply fold that piece into this program. There certainly is a financial impact, and we can model that and get a sense of what that all means, if that's helpful. The other piece of this that uh, has been kind of kicked around by members of council, um, I've just heard, uh, I guess through the grapevine, is maybe some appetite or interest in expanding the total amount of rebate. Yes. Right now, it's limited to 500. Yes. And. The question is, and it's a very simple fix, uh, simply dialing that number somewhere north of that number. Uh, and again, we can mod look at history. I did provide you some of the yeah. history of payments yeah. since the inception of the program. And so if you change those figures, we can look at history and get a pretty pretty good sense for estimating uh, what the likely financial um, exposure is of that. Right. And and do recall, this is a matter that's budgeted in the budget every year. So right. it would be something that's exactly the right time to be talking about this. And this is, pro we're probably spending a lot less on this than we did on the previous one, right? Yeah, if you look in your packet, there's this yeah, simple there's overview a, here. Um, interestingly, in 2014, you'll see our, our total payments tailed off considerably, and I believe that had everything to do with the fact that the state of Maine changed the eligibility requirements, mm -hmm. right. and we ride on their coattails yeah. in that respect. Um, I think that number might climb a bit as people become more acclimated and get back on the program. I think so, too. Uh, the state, I believe, and I think I also provide you some guidance yeah, information, it looks as though they, mm -hmm. the state is actually sweetening oh, you know. the state benefit now. So this past year, it was a, a total maximum award of 400, yeah. and now they're looking at uh, 900 as the maximum. That, yeah. So that may, you know in and of itself, you know, entice more people to apply. No, I know. You know what they want. So to. my hunch is that we'll probably get back to historic levels mm -hmm. in the 120 range, if you will. That's what we had been kind of holding. You, you think 120? Is that what you just I don't know. I, I you mean without changing the amount? Uh, See, what I'm thinking about is, is 
Back in 2010, 11, and 12, 13, it was based upon the old. Um, it was. It was. In the old system, and a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, could apply for that and got it. Right. And now, because they changed the amount of earnings and stuff like that, they kicked it way down. Yep. They did two things. They changed the eligibility right. standards and they severely, severely reduced the total rebate. Right. right. Both things had a negative effect on participation, I suspect. But just my my point is that it, we were spending roughly one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty, one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year in the old way. Right. And, and this year we spent seventy-five thousand dollars. Right. There's certainly no no reason why we can't bump the the minimum. Yeah. So some of these people, it's it, it's a lot that, of money to them. Though. Do you, um, I mean, I'm really sad that I'm not getting have, any more of it. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but do you, I'm sorry to, to call you out, Chair, <laughs> Chair, <laughs> Chairwoman <laughs> Holbrook, but I know this is something that's been important to you. Is there? Did you want to? Mm -hmm. um, sorry to do that. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I just know that this is important to you, and I want to make sure that you're heard. If you have, I know you have an opinion on this. <laughs> Thank. <laughs> I always have an opinion. I on know. Um, certainly, you know, we brought it up a little bit and talked about it in finance last year, and it kind of came out that it really, um, it, as much as it was good intentioned, it really needs to start with ordinance. Um, there was kind of multiple angles that that brought, were brought up. Mm -hmm. One of them was, of course, um, as Tom has brought in front of you, an expansion to to allow for SSI recipients. The other was to actually increase the payout, um, looking at, as you can see, there's significantly less people. We, we paid out 75000 this year. Um, that, seeing how the state had redu reduced some of that benefit, um, it would be really beneficial that th those folks could maybe receive a little more money um, on the local level. Um, there's something else that um, just kind of along the way, you know, and I don't I don't have a good answer for you, but um, you know the process is probably somewhat um, misunderstood or unknown by some of the residents. So some more education, some outreach. Um, I agree. Di divulging my own personal information, which is um, I recently was here at Town Hall with my grandmother um, to try to encourage her to, to utilize the, the, the process and um, to kind of, you know, get yeah. her in line and set up to, to get the paperwork um, because she hadn't filed something, you know, with her state. She wasn't able to qualify with the local program. And, and so, again, even if folks know, maybe they don't realize that they need to do something something else. So That's another um, thing we need to so add to our outreach. Either an outreach effort or um, if you can somehow streamline the program. So, yeah. um, but, but certainly, you know, there, there's some work that could potentially be done for the program that would benefit, I think, a lot of yeah. people. Was your grandmother one of those who hadn't filed the income tax return because she hadn't had to previously? They, uh, yeah. They, they've the, changed it, so yeah. it's crazy because even if you normally wouldn't file an income tax return because yeah. you're not going to get a return because you don't pay any tax because you're under right. a threshold, you have to have filed that return in order to qualify for this credit. And a lot of people Nobody don't would understand know that. that. How would you, I wouldn't know that. Right. So I, I would anyway. caution there might be... You know, again, maybe maybe there's something there that that could get streamlined or worked on, right. or okay. you know, again, a proactively right. coming into the year, you know, ma making sure that you know, if we, I'm assuming we lost people is yeah. why we haven't spent as much. So yeah. if we reach out to those folks at least as a starting point and say, yeah. okay, did you do this? Did you do why, that? Yeah, this why? is how. Sure. You know. Why? Why are you? Why did you not? Like yeah. these are right. these are the steps that you need to take. Do we have that? We have those people in the database. So there's a there's a we could come up with a form form letter to send to those people. Right. Sorry. No, hey. I'm, you, I'm laughing. Go poor Tom. I keep every time I, uh, I see him now, I give him more work. But <laughs> no, uh, well, at Tom, no, I'm happy to work with you on no, it. No, that's easy enough to reach out yeah. to a known Yeah, that's audience. a great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. I mean, if we have the information, why yeah. not send it to them and say, this is this is all you have to do. Let's do this, you know, and we're here to help you do it. All right. 
Thank and, you. And you're right. It thank was you. The total number that of was actually really helpful, Jess. So thank you. So the total number of recipients, uh, we were, you know, in 2012 we were at a high of 310 people received rebates. Yeah. This past year, 206. Yeah. And I have to yeah. believe that it's the complications of the it's state process. Be. It is. And yeah. some people, may not, frankly, may not be eligible. That's not to say that people didn't apply. This is actual recipients. Right. right. Some people aren't eligible. They may have they run may into apply. the same issues that. It, it was our first experience yeah. with right. it. So, no. but it was an interesting. You right. know, not a not a person. I'm not 65, so I, I can't <laughs> qualify for that firm. So I. I um, so it was a, a great learning experience to right. see what it's like for for how frustrating company. for someone to 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 put this, first of all it's not easy for people to put themselves out there sometimes it's, right. it's hard to say that they I need, need I need help so for someone to take that step and then to almost kind of get flat because you didn't do this one piece that yeah. you know I guess that's the thing this isn't charity this no is, this is not uh, needing help it's something if you're eligible you're you should get it changing the mindset of right. but some people can't look at it, it like that yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know what I mean so maybe changing the kind of messaging around it that yeah. it's not how it's presented it this, belong, this belongs to you this is your money <laughs> that's right. this is just you are entitled it. to this well, one thing it. that we've got to keep in mind is that this program is going to be based upon what the state does right. every year. Right, and they're the changing. The state changes, anything. we have to change. Yeah. Um, so I think what we should do is we should be proceeding with a very basic um, plan and don't build in too much detail. The detail yeah. should be more in, mm -hmm. I'm not in a, I'm not a big fan of sending out letters to people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying to explain to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no reason in the world why we couldn't have two or three open sessions a year. Send send letters out to people. Have two or three open sessions where we get Tom and maybe Ruth or somebody to come mm -hmm. in and and just have a little yeah. uh, forum on or hey, neighborhood this, meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is what you got to do in do order that. to qualify yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, the assessing office is pleased to help anyone. And they yeah. do quite often uh, walk people through the process, particularly now that it's uh, a bit in flux. Okay. Uh, so is there any interest in advancing each yes. of the yes. two ordinance changes? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, does somebody want to make a motion on that? I move that we expand uh, or amend the property tax assistance ordinance to include expanded eligibility, include disability, and increase the maximum rebate amount. Two. Two. <laughs> two. What? Two recommendations. Well, or can we say to well, a member determined by the council? Can we say that? Because the council's going to take this up. As right. A whole. Well, or I didn't take the time to actually wordsmith how that uh, okay. expanding eligibility, but it strikes me you wouldn't want people to double dip. No. Right. No. Um, so how should we? We have time. We yeah. Have a, let's wait one more month. Let's wait. And I okay. will come up with actual text changes that okay. won't affect, because uh, we're in kind of a lull period right now. Okay. So we have time. Oh, uh, so, so let's move. Okay, hey, so no second. No, we're, no second. I on withdraw th that motion. And I make a new motion. Okay. That we um, move to our next meeting in January for the discussion and details mm -hmm. on expanding property tax assistance ordinance uh, to expand eligibility, to include disability, and to increase the maximum rebate amount. Great. Second. Okay. All those in favor? <laughs> it's a vote. All right. I will have actual text changes Thank you know, straight through and underlined so you can see how all it right. works. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Yes. Appreciate Thank it. Yes. Um, item number seven is future meeting dates. Uh, my plan was to continue them for the next foreseeable future. Um, the third Tuesday of every month at this time. Is that okay with would, my fellow counselors? Uh, I like the idea of having it the same, you know, third Tuesday, so at least I've known well, that's what, what I'm doing. Well, that's what I'm asking. Uh, one o'clock, I think, and I, it doesn't matter to me personally. As long as I've got it booked ahead, I can meet any time. Uh, but I'm wondering about we got some feedback from the count, uh, from council, excuse me, from the public prior. Right. And at one o'clock is a difficult time for people to get away from work, right, and, and whatnot. So I I would like to look at late afternoon. Um, I'm not. I, we talk, uh, Tom and I talked about that, and I think if something comes up and someone has, you know, there's something on our agenda and someone can't meet it, then we. 
might have some flexibility as the months go on, but for the for see, for right now, I'd like to just get this in the books. Um, That's why I'm saying I'd like to put it at four o'clock because it would be well, easier for me too. Because right, four o'clock is not for, does not work for me, unfortunately, on Tuesdays. Um, so that's not going to work. I could do... Or first thing in the morning. <laughs> that is, it doesn't work for... Yeah. I'm not sure if that's any better than one. No, no I know. Well, I mean, I'm just I'd rather keep it at one. Um, how about if we say the next six months we do it at this and then we'll revisit it? I would say the next three months and then let's look at it see how it works. We're here too. <laughs> I'm splitting the hairs, but I'm, I'm I, three stuff. months is not is it doesn't. Tracy's got scheduling. We're going to lose the time. There's like 900 committees that need to meet in this space, so that's part of the reason why they were asking us to do one specific meeting time. Do you have an opinion? <laughs> yes, we're looking at you. I don't care. I can be here anytime. This is the best time for me. Do so. you have an opinion? Well, first and foremost, I think a group ought to meet when it is most conducive to its members to right. encourage attendance and participation. Right. But I, I am mindful, and I think you should play it by ear, if you hear a course of complaint that you're not making this convenient to the public. <laughs> I, got one, I got one email from someone, and we were able to work through that. So I'm not – I'm just – I'm trying to just make the point that at this point in my schedule – Unfortunately, I cannot do um, late in the day. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see you. No, hey. Um, it, 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 my apologies for butting in. I'm just adding my two cents for availability where I'm an alternate for, for your committee. Um, preferably, if, if, if you can all agree to either a morning or an evening, um, I'm not too picky on a day. But, but certainly, like I said, I mean, primarily I suspect it's you guys and, and you are the members, and like I said, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just your alternate. But um, for me, from a work standpoint, I do work. So, you know, standing meetings and, and either morning or late afternoon, evening, whenever, but, but certainly kind of one scope or the other. Um, it's a lot harder for me, myself, to leave midday um, rather than, you know, that way I can know I can either work in the morning or work in the evening because I commute for, for, for my business. So, okay, then I'm um, going to have to, we're going to have to put it on hold then and I'm going to have to look at some stuff. <laughs> so sorry, we're not going to be able to come to a resolution today. I'll try to get. So let's keep it at 1 o'clock for the first next quarter. Meeting. And then I will work on well, getting. Well, that's why I said for three months. Yeah, do it quarter, do it for quarter. In March, we'll make a change. We'll All right, everyone, stop, quarter. stop, please, stop. Um, give me uh, January, and I will figure out something for morning for child care, and then we'll move our meetings to morning to make it easier for everybody else. Okay. Do you want to have it for January 20th? Please. What time? At 1. And then I will I will make a figure out arrangements from there. We'll include that as the agenda item. Please. Just to kind of finalize that. Yeah, piece make sure. Next Thank you. January 20th at 1. And I appreciate can we talk it. items? Uh, so we know yeah. we know that open burning will come back as a further discussion. Yeah. Um, if we could put that first, Tom. Sure. And then I will have actual text changes yes. drafted so you can look after the property tax stuff and yes. hopefully you'll be in a position to move that along. And then um, we do. I, I have we have been putting off the Pine Point. That was um, what I was going to ask. Yeah. The parking at Pine Point. I'd like to try to start. Nailing that down that in the winter. Before the and exactly. spring. And, and, and your issue. And parking on and parking Bayview. Bayview for, parking Bayview? For um, Ed. Okay. Parking at Pine Point and Bayview? Yes, please. Shall I, uh, for Pine Point, shall I invite the yes, please. previously interested parties? Yes, please. If I can, I'll reassemble with that. Yeah, and I think so I have some should, of those. You know, those two should be handled totally separate. Well, they will be. They'll be different, okay. separate okay. agenda items. Okay. They're two totally different issues. Okay. And uh, for Higgins Beach, is there anyone in particular we should provide notice to? Hmm. Like other councils? Leonard Chabot. No, uh, interested Glenn? parties. I, I, with Pine Point, we have a sense of folks that have had I know. involvement. Glenn Chabot will, will, will make sure that the proper people are here to present. 
they're all set to present. They're just waiting for a date. Okay, so it'll be January. How about the Higgins Speech Association? Yes. I it's think he's got part it part taken it. care of. Um, part of it. I'll be in touch with Glennis, and if there's something in writing, I'll certainly get it Please. to you in advance. Yeah, I'd, I would really appreciate that. Is that we good? have, uh, yeah, I think you've got plenty to talk about. Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, item eight, somebody make an adjournment, please. I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks.